the bobwhite is, is a really important species to a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people really enjoy seeing them. And they also, of course, hunting is really, really important. A lot of parts of South Texas, economically, it's uh, as important as white-tailed deer, if not more important, wherever we do have the habitat for quail, where people can hunt them. So let's talk a little bit about the basics. Uh, bobwhite quail, they're a, a, a ground bird. They, they live on the ground. They live in uh, native grasslands primarily. They nest on the ground. Uh, a couple things, they generally don't need water, uh, uh, free water out in the, in the landscape, and they, uh, they have a variable diet depending on the time of year. Quail are a highly reproductive species. They live by producing as many babies as they can, and that post populations grow really high during the nesting season, and then slow attrition over time. So they're kind of a boom and bust, as a lot of people talk about it. When the conditions are great, they do wonderful. When the conditions aren't so great, their populations decline and wait for the next boom cycle. Uh, they nest on the ground, herbaceous vegetation. The breeding season is generally about April through July. And uh, they lay up to 15 eggs, which the, the, the young are actually precocial. Once they hatch, they pretty much leave the nest very quickly and immediately start moving around in their environment following the, the parents. Uh, and the young feed primarily on insects, which is very important when we're talking about managing for quail species. So when we're talking about quail, we're talking about habitat. Quail need habitat. They need the right habitat to survive. You can't, uh, a lot of people ask me, hey, can I just raise them in my barn and then let them go and then I'm gonna have quail, right? Well, from a long-term perspective, that's not gonna happen. Quail need that specific habitat to survive to make it through. When I talk about habitat, that's a suite of resources and environmental conditions that uh, determine the presence and survival of a population of wildlife through time. And I mean through time. You can release pen raised quail in, onto your ranch in that any time that you want, and they may persist for weeks to months, maybe even longer. But when I talk about persistence, I talk about species being able to survive over time, produce young, and sustain themselves. And that's where the pen raised birds generally don't make it. They might be there for that hunting season, but they generally aren't going to continue to persist through time and reproduce. And so that's why we got to talk about the native quail, the wild quail that are out in the landscape, and how you can uh, support those populations through time. And it's all about habitat. When we talk about habitat, we're talking about the four major components. Food, shelter, water, space. Very, very simple. So when we're talking about quail, their adaptations for survival and all the things that they need, they're very, very uh, specific in what they need, but it's also kind of general across the landscape. That's why quail are found in lots of different ecological regions. So we're talking about food. We're talking about quail, adult quail, generally about 60 to 80% of their diet is seeds and grains, uh, generally from forbs. Uh, some of the grass seeds that they'll eat, but if you're talking about um, uh, some of our exotic grasses that produce a lot of little hard seeds, it takes several thousand of those seeds for a quail to survive. So they need a lot larger seeds. When you're talking about um, crotons or sunflowers, things like that, that's the kind of stuff that they're looking for. Um, grasses will provide some seeds, but they also provide a lot of that component of that habitat. The next largest component of the diet is insects. A lot of farmers don't really like insects because of their, uh, their farm fields and things like that, but it's extremely important for survival of quail, especially in that spring and summertime for nesting females as well as for the young. When the young first hatch, the vast, the, pretty much their entire diet is insects until they get larger and they're, they're able to start eating uh, uh, seeds and things like that. But you're really looking at insects are extremely important. Their diet is different depending on the time of year. So in that uh, winter time, you're looking mostly at the hard seeds for the males uh, and the females. But when you get into spring and summer, those females are gonna switch to insects because they need that protein uh, to produce those eggs uh, for, for that nesting. So insects are very important, but so are those seeds. Water, uh, get a lot of questions about water. Here in South Texas, generally everyone thinks, you know, I've never been to a ranch where I can't have, have seen too much water. Uh, normally that's a really important thing to add to the landscape, be it troughs, be it ponds, be it uh, creeks, drainages, things like that. But when it comes to quail, water is of course very, very important, but they get most of their water, the vast majority of it from what they eat, from dew on the grass and things like that. So if you're looking at managing for quail, adding water to the landscape in a uh, a trough or ponds or things like that is generally the, a very low on the totem pole. You want to look at other habitat aspects, not necessarily water, so definitely keep that in mind.
So like I said, they, they, uh, they get most of their water from, from the food they eat and do and things like that, but they will use free water when it's available. So you get a lot of questions. Hey, well, I saw the quail at my pond and they were bathing or they were drinking. Yeah, they'll use it when it's available, but realize that that water also attracts things that may not be the best for quail, be it uh, some of their biggest nest predators, skunks, raccoons, things like that. Across the landscape, the, the more dense those water sources are, the easier for those nest predators to be across that landscape as well. So you're kind of thinking about, is that really helpful for the quail or not? That's a pretty good question, but basically, if you're very interested in quail, the wa adding water to the landscape is probably the lowest on the totem pole versus what's going on uh, as, as far as your, habit your other habitat aspects, be it grasses, escape cover, things like that. Cover is the most important aspect for promoting quail populations on the landscape. We're looking for different cover types, nesting cover, brooding cover, screening or escape cover, and loafing cover. Y'all all know, just like I do, when it's 105 degrees in South Texas, nobody wants to be in the middle of the sun. And these quail chicks, when they've hatched, they can't survive, or they only survive for a very short period of time in the middle of the sun. They gotta have shade. So all these cover types are very important. And across uh, Texas, probably the most limiting factor for quail habitat, for quail surviving, is nesting cover. Nesting is really important. If they, if they can produce a lot of young, and those young can survive, that's gonna keep that population going. If production is very poor, that's how those populations decline very quickly. We're talking about nesting cover. We're talking about um, healthy bunch grasses. Uh, one of the things I noticed with, with a, a lot of ranches in South Texas, or across Texas in general, people like to get out their mowers and like to shred the minute that grass starts growing, right? We want to shred that down, make it look clean. People might be worried about snakes, or they want it to look nice and clean for when people come out. Well, that's eliminating a lot of that nesting cover that those quail need. What, what quail are going to nest in is they're going to nest in bunch grasses, about a basketball in size, with the, the dead grass from last year still standing, 12, 15, 18 inches tall, with the green new growth coming up underneath that. That's what they're gonna nest in, okay? And we need to have lots of that on the landscape. If you just have one or two good clumps, that's not gonna work so well. You need to have minimum of 300 grass clumps per acre. Better would be 1,000 grass clumps per acre. Now you're hearing 300 glass cl grass clumps, you think, wow, that's a lot of grass. It's really not. If you're talking 300 grass clumps per acre, that's one good nesting clump per 12 or 15 feet. A thousand per, per uh, acre is about one per seven feet. So that's not a lot of grass, but it still has to be the right grass out there. They will nest in uh, mature uh, prickly pear clumps as well, but that's only if, uh, a lot of times, that's only if those other structures, those grasses aren't available for them to nest in. Brood rearing cover. I told you those chicks eat insects. Insects are really, really important for them, and they get, those insects are, are gonna be produced in our forbs, our weeds, our, uh, sunflowers, our crotons, all these weeds that come up in the spring, usually they're gonna be kind of pretty tall. Uh, a lot of people think that looks dirty from the landscape perspective, but that's what those quail need. If you look at, if you ever lay down and you look underneath a, a croton patch, croton patch almost looks like, or even sunflower patch, looks like an old growth forest to a quail chicks that's, a, that's about two inches tall. So the, that, that brood ring cover is, is really important for those chicks to survive. They're protected up above from predators, and, but they're also underneath, they can run in between all those different patches and get, catch the insects they're looking for. Think of a little bit of mini, miniature vol velociraptor chasing after insects. That's what those quail are. So that's the kind of things that they need. So there, there's a good, uh, on, this, on this slide, there's a good perspective of what you're, when you're underneath the croton uh, patch and you're, and you're just a little bitty guy, think of what it looks like. It's an old growth forest to a quail chick. Escape and loafing cover. We don't really give that enough credit in a lot of South Texas. You're talking about brush clumps, thick, dense clumps of brush that are so thick that when a quail dives into it, a predator can't follow them in there. That's what you're looking for. If it's, if it's a pretty small clump, they can just bust out, the predator can bust through before they can get out the other side. Here in South Texas, we're blessed with a good uh, diversity of brush species. Uh, agarito, uh, lope bush, Black brush, wahio, hog plum, prickly pear, big tall prickly pears, those, those are quail fortresses. They need somewhere to escape, especially this time of year when all those raptors are migrating through. That's, those are the fortresses for those quail to hide in. Space and arrangement. Can't talk enough about uh, space and arrangement of all those resources. Quail don't migrate. A quail, a covey of quail is gonna use anywhere from 25 to 40 acres. 
They gotta have everything they need within that 25 to 40 acres for that tubby to survive. So they gotta have uh, access to food, they gotta have access to all the cover types, they gotta have access to all the cover that they need, all within that area. So we talk about crazy quilts. Having all those different pieces all together, that's what we're talking about. So on this slide is a really good example of having those different aspects available and in a really good crazy quilt throughout that landscape. The, the more diverse the landscape is, with open areas, brush, different species of brush, grasses, forbs, that's what we're looking at when we're looking at quail populations and quail habitat. So on this slide here is just kind of an annual calendar of the different habitat types that are used at different times of year, um, be it those, uh, those open grasslands to those brushy areas, especially during migration. A lot of people say, oh, I saw quail all summer, but now they're gone. What happened? Right now, migration is at its peak. All these, all these uh, uh, hawks are coming through. So those quail move to the thick areas so that they can hide from those predators. So what is suitable habitat? In general, we're talking about 300 glass cr grass clumps per acre, good, healthy grass clumps. We're not talking about one piece of grass, we're talking about basketball sized clumps, uh, about five to 25% brush cover, and 50 foot diameter blocks or strips. We also need bare ground. Why do we need bare ground? When those seeds from those plants, from those forbs fall to the ground, the quail gotta be able to get to them. If the grass thatch is too thick, they can't get to them, and so they're not able to feed. We also need a lot of forbs. 30 to 60% forb cover is really, really good from a quail perspective. So just talking about the different habitat types and the different things they need across Texas, not just South Texas, but Central Texas, North Texas, Rolling Plains, all those different areas. We're looking for those, those important habitat types for them to survive. So let's talk about quail populations throughout the year. I told you they're a boomer or bust species. When quail populations, they are at their highest in the spring. When all those chicks hatch, that's when your population is at the highest. And then that population slowly declines throughout the year until late winter, you're at your lowest population of quail on the landscape. And of course, they start nesting and they start uh, coming up again. We generally lose uh, quail. A single quail is gonna live about six months. That's on average how long they live. So they are born to die and everything eats them. So if you're worried about quail getting eaten on the landscape, it's gonna happen. They're, they're just all kinds of critters are gonna eat them. So you gotta have the right habitat on that landscape for them to survive if you want them to persist through time. So let's talk a little bit about weather and quail abundance. In good habitat, where the, everything that quail need uh, is there, about 90% of the uh, quail abundance can be predicted per year uh, by April to June rainfall. We get good rainfall during that time, which promotes really good nesting. You have good quail populations. You don't get good, quail, good rainfall that time, like the drought of 2011, when we had very, very few quail. That's a natural part of the cycle. If y'all didn't, if y'all noticed, everyone probably saw a huge boom in quail the last 15 and 16, 2015, 2016. That had a lot to do with uh, land use changes, land uses, habitat availability, and that timing of that rainfall. So it's a ephemeral resource, and it's a resource that uh, uh, you take advantage of in the good years, and you protect in the bad years. So that comes down to where have all the quail gone? Right now, people probably aren't thinking about that. In the Rolling Plains, and in South Texas, and in the Northern Plains, quail are doing, have done really, really well the last few years. Talk, let's talk about 2011, 2012, 2013. There was a huge concern about quail population. Everyone thought they were gone. What's going on? Is it fire ants? Is it uh, exotic grasses? Is it turkey? Is it cracks in the soil? All the chicks fell in. What's going on? Well, that rainfall had a huge part of it. We were in a really, really bad drought, and we finally come out of it, and we've seen what happens when you add rain to the landscape. But I will say that quail populations, uh, quail uh, can be found in the entire southeastern U.S. and most of Texas, except for far west as Bob White can. And in those areas where uh, usable habitat is, that's where you find the quail. We, we get onto that because we're talking about there are other species that are declining that use very similar habitat types. Uh, loggerhead shrikes, uh, western meadowlarks, eastern meadowlarks, a lot of our grassland birds, they're all declining in a very similar way. And it's not because of fire, it's not because of these other things, it's because of loss of habitat. Things have changed on our landscape over the last 10, 20, 30, 50 years. To be honest, we've been talking about um, declining quail populations in parts of the country for over 100 years. 
So it's not a new thing, it's just as land uses change, those populations don't have the habitat that they need. Loss of habitat, I can't stress that enough. Where you don't have quail populations, especially in these good years, it's because you don't have the habitat for them to live in. Anyone here is from East Texas, you probably haven't seen a wild quail in a long, long time. Things have changed over there. The habitat has changed in the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You've got to get the habitat right before you can get those quail populations back. Some of the things that have happened, conversions to improved grasses. Talk about the Bermuda belt in Texas. Bermuda grass is a very difficult thing. Quail can't live in Bermuda, good Bermuda grass pastures. It's great for cattle, it's not great for quail. Overgrazing, brush encroachment, fragmentation. Those are big things that are occurring. Changes to those monocultures of, it, of exotic grasses, uh, KR bluestem, buffalo grass, uh, guinea grass in some of our sandy areas, Bermuda grass, all of those things coming in, they form dense monocultures where there's little room for bare ground, few forbs, and that's difficult for those quail to survive it. They may nest in things like buffalo grass, but if it's only buffalo grass and nothing else, the quail aren't gonna be able to survive in there because their food sources are not there. This is just a good description, good picture showing improved pasture versus native grasses. You see the, the bare ground for, uh, on, one, on the native grasses and the non-bare ground on the others. Without that bare ground, there's no way for those quail to move through there, and there's no way for them to find food or get food. So that's the, the loss of quail in those areas. Overgrazing is a, uh, uh, has been an impact on a lot of areas where people, you know, cattle was king. Historically, cattle was king. As we're changing to more of a, uh, a wildlife-focused landscape, people more, especially here in South Texas, people are thinking more about these cattle densities and how they can manage that landscape to still have that diversity there. Brush encroachment. You know, in parts of South Texas, back in, up until the 70s, we had pronghorn. We're not gonna have pronghorn in South Texas at this point anymore. Brush encroachment has been a big factor. Now, brush is extremely important for quail, especially in the droughts. That's where the quail are gonna move to, but still, when you have thick brush and no nesting cover underneath, no areas for those quail to feed, that could be a loss of the, the quail populations across South Texas. Could be pretty good deer habitat, but it may not be the best habitat for quail when it's 100% brush cover. So how do we write that chip? How do we get uh, 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 quail back on the landscape where they may not have been seen for many, many years, even in the good years? Let's talk about modifying our, our land uses, restoring our grasslands, and managing brush encroachment. That's what we're talking about. Getting the right habitat on the ground and maintaining that right habitat on the ground. But at what scale? I told you a covey quail uses about 25 to 40 acres. So if you've got 25 or 40 acres, or even 100 acres of amazing quail habitat, but you're surrounded by a desert for quail, you're probably never gonna have quail there because I told you quail populations die. Individuals die very quickly. So you're gonna have atrophy in the population and turnover in that population. So they may day out in one spot, but if there's no way for them to get there from somewhere else, they're never gonna be back. So it's, it's, we gotta have a large scale, some research, Looking at genetics, talks about having a minimum of 800 quail in a population for it to survive. So you're talking 800 quail, 12 to a covey, 40 acres per covey, you do the math on there. You're talking to probably you need a minimum of 5,000 acres of usable space for quail just for a population to survive. So scale is important. A lot of you probably thinking, wow, that, you know, I may not have 5,000 acres of usable quail habitat. What do I do? Talking about cooperating with your landowners. Right, with the landowners around you, talking about your neighbors. Hey, you've got some area over there that's good quail habitat I have over here. Let's do some work to where we can connect it, to where we can get that 5,000 or 10,000 or 50,000 acres of usable space. Then we can maintain quail populations through time. This is where high fencing makes good neighbors. High fencing keeps deer from moving between pastures. And so a lot of times we have landowners that don't argue over who's gonna shoot that big buck, or hey, you shot that young deer that I didn't want you to. People argue over that all the time. But when you have high fence neighbors, they don't do as much arguing over which deer went where, those kinds of things. Guess what? Quail move between those, those high fences. So they can work together and they can manage for quail because if my neighbor has good quail habitat and I have quail ha good quail habitat, there's a better chance for me to have more quail on my land than if he doesn't have good quail habitat and I do. So that's the joke. High fencing makes good neighbors because they're not arguing over the deer anymore. They're, they're, able to, they're, they're more willing to work together. And I've seen that actually with some cooperatives I've worked with, that they're high fenced separately, but they're willing to work together on connecting quail habitat across the properties to promote quail all the way across.
So when we're talking about quail cooperative, we're talking about quail, pretty much four major, major things. Talk about interest. Landowners have to have interest in quail. Getting the knowledge, what kind of habitat makes is good for quail, time and money. Everything takes money. So we're talking about interest. We're talking about a land ownership ethic. I told you, you can't buy pen raised quail, put them on the landscape, and then you're done. You've got to manage that landscape for those quail to live. You've got to have the right habitat and be thinking about the habitat all the time. And uh, one of a really good landowner I work with, uh, he kind of really said that to me one day. He said, I want to leave my ranch every evening a little bit better than when I showed up that morning. That's what you're talking about. A little bit every day is a whole lot better than one project every 10 years. And then knowledge. There's lots of groups out there. Um, of course, I've got to uh, talk about my own agency, Texas Parks and Wildlife. We're a free service to give uh, advice to landowners. But there's also the Natural Resource Conservation Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, AgriLife. Uh, and there's also um, universities, joint ventures, uh, and also other, other groups, uh, Quail Coalition, uh, Quail Forever, things like that. Getting that knowledge out on the ground to help landowners to understand how they can manage their habitats for quail. Time. It takes time. It's not one year. It's not one month. It's not five years. It's everybody doing a little bit of, bit of work every year. This is a draft of the uh, breeding bird survey. You see that drastic decline in quail populations over time. This took 50, 60, 70 years. That means it's not going to take, it's not going to be one or two or three years to reverse that, that decline. It's probably going to take 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years to reverse that decline. A little bit helps. Every year, a little bit helps. The turtle wins the race, right? You ever heard of that tortoise and the hare? It's all about a little bit at a time, thinking long term, managing that habitat, and taking advantage of the good years, and then surviving the bad years, because the next drought is right around the corner. So really thinking a long term perspective on managing that habitat for, for the health of the ecosystem. Money. We know it takes money. Brush management takes money. Uh, prescribed fire, any of these other tools that we use, it takes money. Don't hesitate to reach out to the NRCS, reach out to some of these other groups to see where you can, can find that money, because the money's out there. Quail, grass, and birds are, uh, uh, and also even monarch butterflies, things like that. They all need these native grasses to live, and so there's a lot of money from federal programs, to state programs, to even non-governmental agency programs that are out there that can help with that knowledge and that money to try to get that habitat on the ground. So from a wildlife perspective, you look at this picture here, this is a park. People love parks. The trees are all cleaned up. You got these exotic grasses on the ground. If they're all mowed short, that's what, that's what we like. That's where we want to spend our time playing Frisbee, having picnics, things like that. But that's not what's good from a wildlife perspective. So we got to change our mindset to what's, what's good from a wildlife perspective and figure out what they need and then realize the beauty of that. We want to look at diversity. We want to have lots of different plants out there, lots of different species. You want those forbs, you want those weeds, you want to see lots of insects, you want to have all that stuff out there. Diversity is a spice of life, and so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about managing quail populations.